Now, what about observation time? In other words, if you try to reacquire these signals now, how long do you think you would have to look maybe in order to see them? If, if you've seen two in this data set that seem to be from the same star system, maybe that might indicate some sort of periodicity? So like Peter said, these eight signals are from five stars. So there are some repeats, but they are at very different frequency band. So they might as well be entirely different signals. We would ha we wouldn't I think we we would hesitate to call them repeating sources just because the characteristic from one detection to the other is so different. The fact that it comes from the same set of stars. So can you, well, at least it's a target though. At least it's a place to look. Yeah. And so do you guys have any plans to look more deeply into these star systems and train a you know, radio telescope there for longer than say four hours or whatever the data set is to, you know, say, can you turn a radio telescope there and watch it for several days if you can get the telescope time, which obviously that's a problem. But is that an option here to make sure that maybe... It's like the wow signal back in the 1970s. We can't watch it 24 seven, so we don't know if it repeats. So is that the same case here? I mean, can you, <laughs> is there any hope for a meaningful follow-up on these candidates? Yes, yeah, it's, it's tough because obviously we like to look at it all the time and see if it repeats. And that's the only way we can verify the signals is to really see them again. But there's so much competing interest here. There's a lot of interesting science to be done. So we can't <laughs> just monopolize the telescope and look at these sources. But yes, um, Breakthrough Listen collaboration, we do have time allocation on the Green Bank Telescope. So I think as much as we can, we would like to look at it again. And we, we also mentioned in our research article that we would really encourage other scientists whenever they have the, the telescope resources to look at these sources. Now, signal strength, were these strong signals or were they just barely there? You know, is this something that, that if we turn a radio telescope to it, might it be lost in the noise except occasionally or something along those lines? So the cool thing about this kind of algorithm is that it just it can still pick up it has no cutoff for how loud these signals need to be and so it can be so we can characterize them with signal to noise ratio and so you know on the low end we have a detection of the eight we have one that's at six signal to noise ratio or six snr and then on the upper range we have something on the order of like almost 100 or something signal to noise ratio so in 100 snr is like quite loud of a signal and so these range quite dramatically and but for the most part these signals at least looking them by eye at these spectrograms look like very they stand out quite a lot from the background noise they are quite quite bright signals for the most part now with these signals so what strikes me is is particularly important here is that earth us we broadcast all across the spectrum, right? Or mostly across the spectrum, anything we can use. So wouldn't that suggest that seeing signals at different frequencies, shouldn't that be expected with an alien civilization? Now, some hypo, I mean, so that is the situation where you're, where, where necessarily the aliens are not trying to contact us. It's, it's a, it's a difficult, it's difficult to answer. But if an alien civilization were actually trying to reach us, they wouldn't be hopping at different frequencies all the time to try to get our attention. They'll probably focus their energy to one single small part of the band to wave at us effectively, right? And so to be switching between different frequencies all the time wouldn't make too much sense, at least to me, but perhaps there's some argument otherwise. Now, what do we know about the candidate stars? I mean, are any of these stars, you know, these nearby, what was it, 810 stars, are any of them sun-like? Are they where you might expect to see an indigenous alien civilization? Out of the five stars, I think they have different spectral types. Um, we don't know too much of these stars. We just know that none of them have been reported, to, none of them have been reported to have an exoplanet. 
but that doesn't really preclude the idea of a civilization. They, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, they could. Who knows what a circumstance of an alien civilization is? We need to actually see one first. Now, what other data sets might you apply this algorithm to? Are there other sets out there, say, uh, from the Allen Telescope Array or the SETI Institute or something like that? Can you go into that data and use this algorithm to search for missed signals there? So they, so right now we can use this kind of algorithm for single dish telescopes. So there is chance to use this on data from, say, parks, but it is still, as I say, a limited to a limited technology and a limited algorithm in adapting to different kinds of setups with different kinds of telescopes. Now, the Allen Telescope Array is, like you said, an array, and it has multiple dishes, and there needs to be a meaningful way of like orchestrating all these dishes together, all these antennas together, to make some kind of detection. And so that's the difficult part. So this work, as it stands right now, is a demonstration that this idea of using deep learning and using some kind of similar framework is able to solve our problem in some meaningful capacity. Now, how that would look like with different setups, with different data and different telescopes, needs to be adapted to be more general. Hopefully that clears up that. It does, but that's interesting that there is a difference between... A, an array and a single dish telescope. Does that confound radio astronomy actually in general, just the two different setups? No. So, okay. So here is, so the only reason, at least from what I understand, that there is a difference is how we filter for RFI or for our techno signatures that we care about. So to give you some understanding, the single dish telescope with the GBT, what we take is we take our telescope, we point at a star and point away from it, see if the signal disappears. If it doesn't, that's RFI, that's interference. If it's if it doesn't disappear, it's interference. And if it does disappear, then it's potentially one of our signals of interest. Okay. Now with a like a multi-dish setup, like say down telescope array or with our new work with Meerkat or the VLA, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be forming multiple beams or uh, onto the night sky into some part, some patch of the night sky. And what we're going to do is we're going to see if, if a signal registers a hit on multiple of these beams, right? So if it registers a hit on multiple beams when we're looking at different targets, then that's an indication it's probably interference, right? It's interfering with all your observations, no matter where you're pointing the telescope at. And so the idea here is that one is a temporal filter, right? You're looking at something, then you look away from something, and you look back again. Versus a an array-based telescope is a spatial filter, in a sense that you're looking all at the same time. Imagine you got like 64 eyes looking at the night sky, and then, you know, this signal seems to be triggering a hit on multiple of your antennas. That's probably an indication that it's RFI. That's a spatial filter, right? It's, it's filtering it using by looking at multiple areas of the night sky at once. And so fundamentally how we do SETI is different than how we did SETI with a single dish telescope, which is why we need to develop a more general algorithm that works for all these different kinds of approaches. Is that, is that clear? Yes. Now, were these signals, these candidate signals, eight out of 810, were these candidate signals at any interesting frequencies, such as did you see anything at, say, 1420 megahertz or where it's hypothesized that a communicating alien civilization might place a signal to get the attention of other scientists that would know what that frequency means? At least what I understand is that there's a couple that are in 1430 to 1470 megahertz range. Um, so it's not quite in the the golden 1420 hydrogen line or anything like that, but it is somewhere close to it. So that is kind of, I think there were two, I believe, signals that were somewhat close to the sort of interesting range. But yeah, that was pretty much it. The others were in vastly different parts of the band. So one was like in 1100, another one's like in 1600, uh, something like that. So they're kind of all all over the place. Now you said the range was one to two gigahertz, right? So so it's it's all over the place essentially. Right. 
as opposed to hydroxyl line or something like that. Now, I have to ask a certain question. Yeah. And either of you might be able to address this. So we had a, algorithms for SETI, as they were. And you guys have now created a new one that can search better. Is there still room for improvement? Yeah, definitely. Um, so this is a field that this is a project I'm actively working on. And so right now this work was done, you know, almost two years ago. Right. So this is at least in terms of what I'm trying to build is to me is no longer actually state of the art to me. It is still great in that we actually finally did a search. So as in actually completely in a search, it is still considered state of the art in some regard. But, you know, we're working actively on improving uh, this this approach. And so so some rooms for improvement are to a scale up the data that it was using. So it only looked at Green Bank Telescope data, but it obviously would not really generalize to some other telescope that you would have, say, parks. So the idea, one idea is to improve it with more data. And another approach is to, like I said, adapt this to a multi-antenna setup to do SETI. And so that does not exist yet. There's no... Uh, deep learning solution for those kinds of problems. So right now, this is kind of only localized to just GBT, and that's pretty much it as of so far. Um, and so lots of active research going into extending this to uh, more of our facilities that we're working, that we're doing studying on. 